Um, oh, look at that. It's like on command. Thank you so much. Um, it's a joy to see you all here in worship this morning. Uh, I am Pastor Jessica, for those of you who don't know me, and I am delighted to welcome you to worship alongside Pastor Jim, who's in the back awaiting the processional. I have just a few announcements, and we're going to start with our trusty yellow cards. So I'd love to invite you to pull these out um, and let us know that you're here. Uh, give us any prayer requests, any contact information change, any notes. Um, this is a great way to um, let us know, and you can put these in the offering plates as they um, come through later in the worship service. And I have just three announcements for you this morning. First, if you haven't smelled it already, this morning is the Habitat Fundraising Breakfast. Um, this will go towards their um, our, I guess, right? It's our Habitat group. Um, our build in the spring of the new year, um, raising money um, so that they can um, contribute both to the trip there, but also to building that house for the family in need. Um, so it's by donation, but please consider going and eating some breakfast this morning and supporting that cause. Um, speaking of supporting causes, uh, right now is also a food drive for our pantry. So in the narthex to the left, um, as you exit, there are bags with lists on them of food that is needed, and the backside has um, Christmas items as well. So it's kind of a choose your own adventure in that regard. Um, but please uh, consider contributing to that food drive as well. Also, um, you have about two more weeks left to purchase wreaths from our Boy Scout troop here at St. Matthew. Um, long, long time partnership with that troop. Um, and so if you would like to um, buy some wreaths, there's a link to that, I believe, in the messenger and on the website. Um, but please, uh, if you would like a wreath, it's a great place to get a wreath. With that, I would love to invite you to um, stand as you are comfortably able. And we are going to join together in our confession and forgiveness to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We gather this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I invite you to kneel as you're comfortably able. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a member of the Church of Christ and by God's authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please stand with me as you're comfortably able. We'll join together in our opening
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. <clears throat> for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the and defend us, gracious Lord. <clears throat> this is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Sing with all the people of God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We pray together the prayer of the day. God of forgiveness, you show your servant David the error of his ways and forgive him for his sins. Forgive us and help us to see how we might differ differently to honor you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. And I would love to invite any children and young people forward to join me. Good morning. You know, to be honest, in the beginning when I was doing announcements, I didn't see many of you, and I was wondering if there was going to be people, be people to join me up here, but look at all of you. We all finding seats? Okay. Have you guys ever made a promise to someone? No. Oh, my bad. Anyone? Any promises? Yeah? What are some promises that we make? None. Do we make promises to maybe behave, right? To act good for our parents? Yeah? Have you guys ever broken that promise? <laughs> None of you, right? None of you? <laughs> what happens when we break a promise like that? Yeah. It's like we're not trusting them. That was very profound. What do we do when we 
when we break a promise. Have you ever said sorry to your parents for breaking a promise? Yeah, yeah, we got some hand raises. And what do our parents do when we ask for forgiveness, when we say sorry? Yeah. You get a, you get a consequence? Yeah, definitely. And then what happens after that? Yeah. They say, I forgive you. They say, I forgive you. Yeah. So today, we're going to hear about God's people not always holding up their promises to God, right? Breaking their promises to God and then saying sorry to God. And then what we're going to hear is that God always says, I forgive you, always. And God continues to keep the promise even when God's people break the promise. Does that make sense? Yeah, so just like your parents are always gonna forgive you no matter what happens because they love you and you're their kids, God feels the same way about everyone in this room. God says, I forgive you no matter what. That sound like good news? Yeah, maybe? Awesome, can we pray? Dear God, we give you thanks for your forgiveness. We know that even when we break our promises to you, that you don't break your promises to us and you forgive us. And that is such a good thing. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. reading from Joshua, the 24th chapter. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in its midst. And afterwards I brought you out. When I brought your ancestors out of Egypt, you came to the sea, And the Egyptians pursued your ancestors with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. When they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did to Egypt. Afterwards, you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you and I handed them over to you and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then King Balak, son of Zippor of Moab, set out to fight against Israel. He sent and invited Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore he blessed you, so I rescued you out of his hand. When you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, the citizens of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I handed them over to you. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove out before you the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and towns that you had not built, and you live in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive yards that you did not plant. Now therefore, revere the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served before the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should take the Lord, forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, 
out of the house of slavery and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statues and ordinances for them in Shechem. Joshua wrote, wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak in the sanctuary of the Lord. Here ends the reading. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from God the Father and Jesus the Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. One of the most famous Old Testament lines across the world. And I've seen this line on countless walls and artwork pieces of my Christian friends and family. Uh, there are so many Pinterest posts of artwork and t-shirts and other items bearing this phrase. And trust me, I am one who would and does wear and display these. Um, I find them to be uh, quite tempting, I suppose, to spend my money on. Uh, but in the popularity of this verse and the ease with which it can be commercialized, I wonder if we have perhaps sometimes lost the gravity 
behind these words. Furthermore, are we remembering the context through which these words arrive to us? Now, if you've been following along the arc of the story that we've been tracing so far in this new lectionary that we are using, you might notice that we just made a huge leap through scripture. For the past six weeks, we have made our way through key points and stories in Genesis and Exodus, the first two books of the Bible. And since last week, we have all of a sudden skipped over three entire books and most of the book of Joshua to find ourselves at this reading for today. So last week, Deacon Sue walked us through Moses receiving and relaying the Ten Commandments. This story, the Ten Commandments, that is, is a story of God and God's people renewing their covenant at the near the, actually the middle of Exodus. And this is a covenant that began with Noah at the flood, which we opened with this program year, right? And then it was furthered through the lives of Abraham and Sarah and their offspring and God was faithful to that covenant all through Israel's enslavement in Egypt and now their escape from Egypt, which is what they've just gotten through when we get to the Ten Commandments. And what ensues in Exodus after the reception of the Ten Commandments and then also in the book of Leviticus and the book of Numbers is Israel's journey through the wilderness for 40 years and also their attempts at being faithful to the covenant of God and figuring out exactly what the Ten Commandments and the covenant of God means in their daily life. There is, of course, inevitable failure. That's why we have so much of the book of Leviticus trying to figure out what rules need to be in place because of the Ten Commandments. But God stays faithful through all of those failures. And in the Old Testament, after Leviticus and Numbers, when we reach the book of Deuteronomy, we learn that Moses, who has been guiding the Israelites through the wilderness— will not be able to enter the promised land alongside his people. Rather, he will die before they enter into it, right at the gate. Joshua will be the new leader of the Israelites, as Moses is told, and Joshua will be the one that leads them into the promised land. And so the rest of Deuteronomy is actually Moses' goodbye speech. And then the book of Joshua begins— And the chapters leading up to where we pick up Joshua for today are chapters that many people reading in our American 21st century context find quite uncomfortable. We got just a summary of it in the midst of the reading for today, but the beginning of Joshua is stories of war and conquest in which Joshua leads the Israelites in battles against those who were currently living in the promised land. And when we pick up the story for today, Joshua and the Israelites are in what is described as rest, an area of rest from their enemies. And here, rest means security from peace, or security and peace from war. And in this time, Joshua grew old, and the time of his death was drawing near. And so like Moses, Joshua gets to have a speech that he gives to his people. So he gathers the tribes together to give this farewell speech. And in his speech, As we heard, Joshua summarizes God's gracious and saving acts on Israel's behalf. This includes the call of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, deliverance from Egypt via Moses and Aaron, guidance through the wilderness, which I just spoke about, leading into the promised land. Joshua Joshua also reminds the Israelites of their covenantal relationship with and commitment to God and obligations to God. In the midst of this speech, Joshua also allocates land uh, for all of the tribes of Israel according to God's command. He establishes refugee cities and Levitical cities, and he reminds the tribes 
that God has fulfilled God's covenantal obligation to them and exhorts them to be then steadfast, to observe the laws given to them by Moses, and he lists the consequences of breaking those covenantal agreements. In short, God has claimed them, called them, freed them, and led them, and now they must respond. And then we get to that famous line, Joshua's statement of faith, and that's Joshua's response to all that God has done for him and for the Israelites. He says, Now therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So that speech and that statement leads the Israelites to renew their covenant with God. But we've just heard that God was faithful to the covenant all throughout their time wandering in the wilderness and since Noah's initial covenant with God. And so one might ask, why does the covenant need to be renewed if God has been faithful to the covenant? They have indeed just heard that God was faithful from generation to generation but God's people have not been faithful to God from generation to generation. God's people need to renew their half of the covenant with God, and each generation will have to renew their covenant with God because as humans, we are wont to stray from our promises to God day in and day out. But the people respond and they say that they will renew their half of the covenant. They will follow and serve the Lord. Joshua responds in a strange way. He says, you cannot serve the Lord for he is a holy God. Well, then what gives, Joshua? Because you just said that you and your household will serve the Lord. How are we supposed to renew the covenant if you've just told us that we are incapable of holding these promises with God? What Joshua means here is that no human being born into a broken world, as all of us are, can perfectly love God, can perfectly fulfill their promises to God, or can perfectly love their neighbor nor can humans perfectly set aside our idols, right? Those objects that we love, those false gods in our lives that we start to serve more than God. This is the truth that each one of us as individuals, and this is the truth about our community as well. This is true of all of humankind and about all communities of humans. This is why each generation must renew their covenant with God, because we all fail continually. As Lutherans, we dive deeper into this concept with the small catechism, and definitely in the third article, or most certainly in the third article. And Luther says in response to the third article of the small catechism, I believe that I cannot by my own strength or will believe in the Lord. Only God is capable of staying faithful. But then after that line, Joseph says something else that's very jarring to hear on a Sunday morning in a Christian church. He says, God will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. But Joshua has forgiven in this moment all of the forgiveness God has had for the Israelites leading up to these moments. Abraham and Sarah's lack of faithfulness to the promise of offspring, the Tower of Babel, the Golden Calf, and so much more. 
And the benefit that we have today is that we get to have 2020 hindsight, right? Looking back in a post-Jesus world, post-Jesus arrival. We have the privilege of having that lens, and we have to keep that in mind as we read this story. We know that all sins are forgiven if only we ask. God has made the ultimate sacrifice for our sakes and for the sake of all of God's children and all of creation. So we know that we are forgiven, named and claimed and forgiven. And the Israelites also persist in God's covenant and in God's promise. And they say fervently to Joshua, we will remain faithful to God. And so Joshua tells them that they will be held to that promise and reminds them all that it means to be in covenant with God. And so they wrote this renewed covenant on a stone tablet and they put it at their altar. So really, this has been a story of the Israelites recognizing what God has done in their lives, recognizing God's faithfulness in their lives, God's grace and presence in their lives, and responding accordingly. And this is really the Christian worldview, right? And the Lutheran worldview. We know that the equation isn't me plus action equals God's grace, but rather God's grace plus me equals action. That action being how we respond to knowing that God's grace has been added to our equation. When we recognize God's grace and presence in our lives, we respond. We turn outward from ourselves because we know that we are saved by God's grace and so we can then focus on our neighbors and creation. So let's ask ourselves, recognize the things that God has done in your life thus far. I'm inviting you into a moment of self-reflection. God has done these things in my life, whatever they may be. God has made the ultimate sacrifice for my sake and for the sake of all of God's children and all of creation. And so knowing all those things, what will I do now? Will I serve the house of the Lord? Now, I want to address what might feel like an elephant in the room right now. Um, I felt it as soon as I mentioned conflict in the Holy Land. A few minutes ago, I spoke about how Joshua led the Israelites in battles against those who were in the Promised Land before them. It's not lost on me that this is coming up, the subject is coming up in the week in which the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the Holy Land has descended into what looks like war. It's heartbreaking. The destruction and violence are gut-wrenching. It's hard to not feel utterly helpless in the face of such brutal terror. Many of my pastor friends have posted on the internet recommendations for young people in their lives to perhaps take a break from social media for the next few weeks because of the violence that we are seeing in real time in our faces on these little screens that we carry with us. And I might recommend that for anyone here as well. It's not just for people under the age of 18. We cannot control the violence that is happening abroad, nor should we ignore it. We can, of course, in the idea of control, vote to be in conversation with elected officials. We can pray. We should be praying fervently. We can even protest if we want, as is our legal right here in America. But if you're like me, it's easy to feel helpless seeing all that is happening, knowing all that is happening in and around the Holy Land and other war-torn places across the globe, too. What can we do? 
while we cannot control the violence that is happening abroad, we also cannot control God's grace. We cannot control or even know where and how God will redeem the situation. We only know that God has promised to be there in the midst of suffering, in solidarity with those who are victims. We know that God weeps alongside those who are weeping. We know that death and destruction are the very last thing that God wants, and also God has promised that death and destruction will not have the last word. We know that God has promised to be faithful in God's covenant to God's people, so God will find a way. God is and will be present with God's grace and God's mercy. That is the hope and the promise that we must cling to in the face of such awfulness. And in the midst of all these things that we cannot control, here is what we can control. We can control how we respond to God's grace in our lives and God's grace in the world. We can look back and see all of the things that God has done for us throughout our lives and throughout history, and we can decide how to respond to that in our daily lives. That is the one thing we can control. Will we live lives that serve God, love God, and love neighbor? May we echo Joshua's statement of faith. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Amen. I will invite you to stand as you're comfortably able. We'll enter into our collective statement of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. I invite you to share a sign of peace with your neighbors.
Will you stand with me as we prepare our hearts and um, our lives to receive uh, this meal? Um, it comes to us um, in the midst of um, a conviction of grace, a grace that met Abraham and Sarah, a grace that met the Israelites um, uh, in, in Joshua's leadership, and a grace that meets us in a Savior who um, gives his life for us. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Take and eat. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We pray together the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The bread is broken and the wine is poured, the gifts of God for the people of God. It is Christ who sets the table. It is Christ who is our host. It is Christ who invites you to come and share in these gifts of life and salvation. All who wish to find Christ in the meal are welcome and invited. If you're joining us at home, um, I invite you to share one another, with one another uh, these gifts and the message uh, that uh, is, is in the midst of them. If you're by yourself, hear this word. The body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink.
please stand with me as we pray and close our service. Lord, you have met us in this meal uh, with, um, with good grace. Good grace that has fed us and claimed us, healed and renewed us. Grace that calls us into a land of plenty filled with promise. Lord, we pray that um, our lives would measure that grace by our actions, our thoughts, in our relationships. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we lift to you the conflict of uh, the Middle East um, that has sprung out again into uncertainty and chaos. We pray for um, the lives that are in its path. Lord, guard all of those uh, civilians and, um, and innocents. We pray especially for, um, for the most vulnerable in, uh, in those communities that you would uh, surround and keep and that you would endeavor uh, to bring um, renewed peace. Lord, um, heal all the sins that have come in all the years previous. And, um, and call us into the gift of, uh, of that search, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we, uh, we pray for, uh, for our own uh, nation, our own neighborhoods and families um, as, as we seek um, uh, to heal and renew uh, loved relationships. We pray that, um, that you would be with all of those that have lost loved ones and, uh, and grieve them in the, um, the season. Of, um, of, of that grief, Lord, um, uh, surround and keep them. We lift to you, Lord, uh, each of those names um, and those lives um, that um, are troubled uh, on our conscience this morning, um, uh, people that we, we worry about, people that are in the midst of conflict or in, in sickness, um, Lord, uh, uh, meet them with uh, renewed grace. With, uh, with healing presence and your love. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Go in peace, serve the Lord.